This week on Q&A, Winslow Wheeler, director of the Strauss Military Reform Project at the Center for Defense Information. He discusses Pentagon spending as well as congressional oversight of the military budget. Winslow Wheeler, director of the Strauss Military Reform Project for the Center for Defense Information. There's a new book coming out in a couple of days, actually, called The Pentagon Labyrinth. What mm -hmm. is it? It's a 150-page handbook guide to the Pentagon. Uh, it's an anthology. There are 10 authors. Um, each of us picked out a subject area that we've had uh, 30 or 40 years of experience in. Uh, some of the essays I, I can boast to say they're truly extraordinary essays uh, to give people an insight beyond the superficialities of how the Pentagon operates and how to cope with it and how to understand what it's doing. Um, it's uh, in the struggle to find a title for the thing. Um, I quickly rejected, you know, the Pentagon for, for dummies kind of title. But I, I asked the people who publicized the Missing Manual series if I could steal their title. They said no. Um, and we settled on the Pentagon Labyrinth as the, the maze of distortions and uh, veils that the Pentagon uses to uh, mask what it's actually up to. Why are you doing this? Um, I think our system of government is breaking down. I think the... Um, system of checks and balances we have in our system are not operating properly. Um, I worked on Capitol Hill for 30 years and um, um, Congress has three essential key powers. The power to go to war, the power of the purse, and the power to, power to investigate. The first two powers to go to war and of the purse are meaningless if Congress doesn't exercise the power to investigate, and it's not doing that. It's doing a lousy job. It's actually trying to not investigate things. Um, and uh, that was my motivation. Uh, others who, who contributed to this um, um, have been observing the Pentagon system from the inside or the military services from the inside and are very uh, disturbed, concerned, worried about what they're seeing. And they're, we're trying to educate a new generation of people to cope with the problems we have, to understand the problems we have, and to find ways to address those problems. To bring everybody up to date that may not have seen other interviews, you work for Jacob Javits of New York, Pete Domenici of New Mexico, David Pryor of Arkansas, and Nancy Kassenbaum of Kansas, right. Senate Budget Committee. Right. Also, you worked nine years for the General Accountability Office. It was right. called GAO, or right. Government Accounting Office at the time. Last week on this program, uh, former Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld was here, and I asked him about something called the Iron Triangle, which he wrote about, which mm -hmm. is the Congress and the committees up on the Hill mm -hmm. that deal with defense, the Defense Department establishment, and the defense industries. Here's what he said when I asked him about that question. Mm -hmm. And the three of them get together and, and develop a, a comfort level as to what ought to be. Now, if somebody comes in then and wants to change that, namely a president of the United States gets elected, and he has views. So take President George W. Bush. He gave a speech at the Citadel. He outlined what he thought ought to happen, how the Department of Defense could be brought into the 21st century. And any changes that are made are tend to be made over the objection of the Congress, the defense contractors and the permanent bureaucracy. They're comfortable with the way it is. They, they've concluded that that's the way it ought to be. And if a president gets elected uh, and comes into office with different views, um, they, they, there tends to be natural opposition to it. I canceled, for example, the Crusader program. I can't think of a worse name uh, in, in this environment we're in than the Crusader, but uh, it was an enormous artillery piece that took two aircraft to move. Uh, anywhere in the world, certainly not something that, that um, was appropriate for the 21st century and, and the asymmetric warfare that we're facing. And the opposition to it was just incredible. 
I mean, the retired community in the Army, the active duty community in the Army, the civilian contractors, the Congress. Your take. A um, couple things. He tried to imply that the term Iron Triangle uh, was something he came up with. That's not the case. He tried to imply that, but for Congress and industry, um, the Pentagon would be doing a pretty good job of things. Um, that's, I don't know what the right word I can use on TV uh, for that. Um, for example, in the Crusader, uh, he had mild opposition from Capitol Hill on that, but the Army was pretty much willing to give up on that. It wasn't a big deal. He thinks it was a big fight. It wasn't. Um, Robert Gates had a big fight on the F-22 and demonstrated far more skill at dealing with Congress than Donald Rumsfeld uh, ever did. Uh, I'm not all that big a fan of Gates on some respect, in some respects, but he's a breath of fresh air compared to Donald Rumsfeld. Uh, why do you feel that way about Donald Rumsfeld? Um, I, I saw your show last week um, and uh, was reminded how aggressive and petulant Rumsfeld is. Uh, the thing that came, came to mind uh, coming in this morning was his behavior with you when you used the word conspiracy about uh, the initiation of the war in Iraq and he was trying to prevent you from using that word. Um, uh, but behind all that bluster and tough talk, there's not much there. Um, Donald Rumsfeld was one of the most unsuccessful secretaries of defense I've ever observed in 40 years of observing the Pentagon. Um, it's an amazing combination of tough, aggressive talk with a failure to cope with the issues as they are beneath that. Uh, he certainly thinks he understands things, but, but he has this superficial, almost trite view about a lot of those issues. And uh, that, it was a very ex unfortunate experience for America to have him as Secretary of Defense. Well, um, the reason that I showed him that letter that was written in 1998, the Project for a New American Century, was because all of the people that signed it, almost all of them, went into the administration. And I sh probably shouldn't have used the word conspiracy, but the point of showing him the letter was that in 1998, that group, and he signed the letter, said that Saddam Hussein should be taken out. Mm -hmm. They succeeded. Wouldn't that, wouldn't, isn't that a, a tremendous success from his point of view, that he was successful, they set out to do it, and they got it accomplished? He didn't understand the problem he had. Um, um, he thought uh, that the problem was to march to Baghdad and kick Saddam Hussein out, and then, then what? He didn't know. He did a poor job of mustering the, the, the attack on Baghdad. Remember, it got stalled halfway up uh, um, um, towards Baghdad, and there's a panic, uh, and uh, it took us longer to go through the, uh, uh, what one analyst called the most incompetent uh, armed forces in the world, the Iraqi armed forces. Uh, then when we got there, um, uh, there was this complete uh, failure to understand what we had just done. You know, as a Christian Western um, uh, uh, nation, we had just occupied a Middle Eastern Muslim uh, nation. And we expected what? We expected them to thank us for it. Um, we expected them to behave towards us like we were their liberators. Um, it takes an abysmal um, lack of appreciation for what you're actually doing to have that kind of you know, approach to the problem. He said in your interview that, uh, well, we did just fine up to the you know, mission accomplished statement uh, by President Bush and the aircraft carrier that yeah, we, you know, we took Baghdad, but you got yourself into a hole that we're, you know, we're just barely beginning to get out of now, uh, uh, eight years later. Um, it was a disaster for American policy in the world, uh, tore us apart domestically, uh, helped to um, bankrupt um, our defense budget 
even though we've been spending huge additional amounts of money. Um, it's precisely that kind of blundering that um, uh, gave us motivation to write that book, The Pentagon Labyrinth, to try to explain to people how you can look at these things at the front end and sort out what you're really dealing with and then make informed, insightful decisions about what the heck you're up to. One of the things you talk about is the budget, and I want to th throw up on the screen some figures that you had in one of your chapters, and we can, I can, we can talk about that. Okay. It shows uh, that there's a base of $548 billion in the defense budget of 2011, right. which is already yep. underway. Mm -hmm. And then w the point of this, though, is if you go down and you see the war spending was not included in the budget, and the overall budget was $712 billion. But then you add up a lot of other right. things that's not stated in the budget. What is, is that the Department of Energy has 18 billion in it? And uh, miscellaneous defense items, 7.6 billion. And national defense budget uh, functions there. You got Homeland Security with 43 billion. Veterans Affairs, 122 billion. It goes down, as you can see there, even the interest payments of 47 billion mm -hmm. to over a trillion dollars right. for the defense budget. Is that a fair, in your opinion? Uh, 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 assessment of what our defense costs are? Uh, defense with a small d, of course. Um, this is what we pay for security in this country. Uh, the Pentagon is obviously a big part of that, but when the Pentagon holds its annual press conference on its budget, it doesn't even reveal its, ent its entire budget. Um, uh, nonetheless, the press um, assiduously um, um, uh, copies from the press release and throws out those numbers. They fail to point out in their own press release that there's another five or six billion dollars of mandatory spending in the Pentagon budget. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't add in the nuclear weapons from the Department of Energy. Sometimes they do add, sometimes they don't add the money for a selective service in the national defense stockpile. That's all the so-called national defense budget function that we see each year on the president's budget. But beyond that, there's all these other security related things. Um, um, Homeland Security, State Department, all those things, even some obscure accounts in the Treasury Department that pay for military retirements and health care. Um, Why is that the case? Why is there money in the, the, in the Treasury Department for defense health? The cynical answer is that appreciating how expensive these things are, people writing the legislation for them wanted to get them out of the defense budget uh, so they wouldn't count there. Um, they're uh, pure and simple defense costs for, for personnel issues. There's another chart I want to throw up on the screen for you to explain that is uh, titled DOD Budget 48 through 2011. Mm -hmm. Tell us what that is. Um, this is defense uh, Pentagon spending since uh, uh, just after World War II, uh, normalized to uh, 2011 dollars. In other words, the, dollars, the dollar values are all equal throughout that chart. Uh, note now that we're now at a post-World War II high in terms of spending. Note that, for example, at the Obama rate of spending, he's going to outspend George Bush, he's going to outspend Ronald Reagan. Um, what's not on that chart is the size of our forces. Um, we now have today uh, the smallest ever Navy, Air Force, and Army we've had since the end of World, World War II. Our equipment is, major equipment is on average older than it's ever been before. Um, the data on training and readiness is scattered and mostly classified, but what's available publicly indicates that we've got serious problems about how, how well we train. Um, in, a in a capsule at a ever increasing post-World War II high level of spending, we've got the smallest, oldest, less ready to fight military we've had since the end of World War II. Why? Why is all this the case? Um, because Congress isn't exercising the oversight function, because the oversight function is dead inside the Pentagon. Um, our system of checks and balances is not working right. Um, we have a system that inside the Pentagon and inside Congress rewards cost. Uh, does not pay attention to combat lessons in designing equipment. Um, it's, it's, it, the, the breakdowns are pervasive throughout the system. 
Um, we've been doing it for decades. This is not a Republican or a Democratic or a conservative or a liberal problem. They've all participated in it happily. There are extremely rare exceptions um, on Capitol Hill, for example, of people who uh, are trying to do something about this. But those people are very rare and they're not being listened to. Here's another 50 second clip from uh, Secretary Rumsfeld where he talks about this requirement that the Congress puts on them. Let's watch. Mm -hmm. When I was Secretary of Defense in the 70s, the defense authorization bill was 74 pages long. When I came back in the year 2001, if I'm not mistaken, the defense authorization bill was over 500 pages. So, so what happened is, in the intervening period, the staffs in Congress ballooned. They went up by a multiple of two or three. The continuing layering of requirements from the Congress, generally stimulated either by the defense community or stimulated by the bureaucracy because they want to perpetuate something, uh, ends up with, with rule, requirement, reports, all of these things. Hundreds of reports are required by the Department of Defense. Hundreds of letters have to be answered uh, for all kinds of detailed things. Your take on that? Uh, it is correct that in the 70s, the Defense Authorization Bill was a few score pages long. Uh, is wrong again. Um, it's now about a thousand pages long. Um, it's not just the report requirements that have thickened the legislation and the accompanying documentation that also is important to the process. Um, in pretending to do oversight, Congress engages in all manner of micromanagement, which moves the P from there to there, uh, but accomplishes nothing in reality. Um, um, part of the process here is what's happened with pork in uh, appropriations and defense appropriations uh, authorization bills in the 70s, they may have been, oh, 20 or so earmarks, mostly by senior members of the Armed Services Committee or appropriations, and they would occupy um, a, f uh, a few uh, paragraphs in the bill and a few paragraphs in the committee report. Now we've got uh, thousands, uh, we're now down to about 2,000 from a previous high of earmarks that occupy page after page um, in the documents that accompany uh, defense bills, and, but also generate all kinds of language inside uh, the bill itself. Um, what I'm trying to say here is we have a thickening of the process, um, but we don't have an improvement in the process. The, the uh, staff on Capitol Hill has grown by leaps and bounds. They justify their existence by generating this kind of brownie in motion in legislation. Um, and um, uh, a lot of it generates a huge amount of bother for the bureaucracy in the Pentagon. Let me ask you about when Ronald Reagan was president, they were talking about a 600 ship Navy. One, did they ever get to 600 ships? Uh, by John Lehman's count, yes. He was the Secretary of the Navy. Right. But today you say they're below 300. Right. Why did that, what happened? Well, and we also spend more on the Navy now than we did in Reagan's era. In constant for, dollars? Yes, for a, for a larger amount of money, we, got a, we have a Navy, just about half of what we had in Reagan's era. Um, what's ha one of the things that's happening here is unit cost. You see it dramatically in airplanes and in ships. The uh, per unit cost is growing far faster than the budget's growing. What that means is that each year, for more money, you can only buy less ships, planes, whatever. And the rate at which you're buying them is, sl is slower than the rate at which they're aging. Ergo, the shrinking, aging Navy at increasing cost. But why is it that we went from 600 down to three, below 300? What was the, who decided that that's what they wanted to do? Uh, and why? I mean, what the strategic uh, reason is what I'm looking for. Well, uh, certainly one of the reasons is, is, is the end of the Cold War, the collapse of the Soviet Union and, and, its, and its Navy. 
Um, but note that today the base parts of the Pentagon budget, the parts that uh, are not included in the war spending, we're now at about $553 billion for 2012. The Cold War average spending was $450 billion in the same value dollars. Um, uh, so in the absence of a huge conventional threat in the form of the Soviet Union and its Navy and its Air Force and so on, um, we're now, with them gone, we're actually spending more, um, but we generate a force far smaller than the one we had uh, in, when John Lehman counted 600 ships in the Navy. But let me show you a chart on U.S. Navy aircraft carriers and ask you to explain this. This is not in your book. This mm -hmm. is one that we got. It shows there that there are 11 aircraft carriers in the United States currently operating. Two in Italy, two in Spain, and you can see there UK, France, Russia, right. India, Brazil, and Thailand only have one carrier. And there's a, China is building, I guess, a couple of carriers, but why do we need 11 and the rest of the world adds up to 10? Uh, I should point out first that um, those 11 in the U.S. Navy are, are uh, now they're all nuclear powered. They're all about 90,000 or more uh, tons, uh, 900 feet or more in length. None of those other carriers uh, are that size or displacement. Um, some of them aren't even capable of, of conventional landing and takeoff aircraft and they need the you know the vertical takeoff uh, kinds of airplanes that are tremendously limited in their capability. Uh, some of them are just helicopter carriers. Uh, so we're, it's not just that we have 11 and the rest of the world has 11. The 11 that the rest of the world have don't really c compare to ours in terms of cost and size and so on. Of course, we have more than 11 if you throw on the uh, helicopter uh, right, carriers. Right, right. Uh, if, if you wanted to include like the, you know, Thai and, and Italian carriers, you'd really include um, most of our big amphibious warfare ships that the Marines use for helicopters and AV-8B. What's uh, the point of us needing 11 giant nuclear aircraft carriers? Uh, it, it fulfills our image of our role in the world. Um, we've come to think in this country that we have some sort of responsibility to police the world that expresses itself in all kinds of ways. Uh, one of those ways is with aircraft carriers that when there's some problem somewhere, there's this silly um, um, sort of public image of the president asks, well, where are the carriers? Um, and as if that's going to solve our problem. Um, um, Secretary Gates said last summer that maybe we should have just eight of them. And he apparently got an earful from the Navy and he retracted his statement a couple of weeks later. Um, the 11 aircraft carriers are part of our national self-image. Um, I think that's about to change. Uh, if Iraq and Afghanistan have taught us anything, uh, it's that um, we're fools to be doing these kinds of things in these countries, occupying them and thinking that we're doing them some sort of favor. Um, and my expectation is that along with the change in the vector of the defense budget in the next few years, we're going to see rethinking of just what do we think we're doing out there and what do we need to, to help us do what we really need to do? And one of those answers is going to be a debate about aircraft carriers. You wrote up in your book. By, by the way, when does this book actually hit the uh, The electronic version <clears throat> is out right now. If you Google the term, the Pentagon Labyrinth, you'll come to the websites where you can get a free download of it. Um, I'm going to pick up the first 500 printed copies uh, Friday this week and take them to a book event next week. Um, uh, and so, uh, yes, it's, it's, it's coming out, it's, and the hard copy will be available next week. By the way, meanwhile, uh, Secretary Rumsfeld's book is number one on the New York Times bestseller list, number one on the Wall Street Journal. He's been very successful in marketing his book. Why do you think that? Uh, because he had the publisher behind him. 
Um, but he's gone to tons and tons of interviews. Oh, sure. I mean, he, yes, he, he, he's a big deal. Um, he, the, the publisher has gone to great lengths to get him on TV and to all kinds of events and so on. It's a, it's a quote, major book, unquote. Um, I haven't had the pleasure of reading all 815 pages of it, um, but from what I understand, it's basically a long staff memo that he didn't write, uh, but edited, basically, uh, full of his version of what's good government. Um, I suspect it's not going to go down in history as a great manual about uh, how, to, how to run governments. But he did also bring with the book the free use of his website right. that has 20,000 items on it. Yeah. <clears throat> and it's free. It's rumsfeld.com uh, that you can get on and research all that. Yeah, apparently he and his, his staff and, and the group I work with were on a parallel track here. Uh, we're doing the same thing. Um, uh, all the footnotes uh, in our the Pentagon Labyrinth lead are, are live in the electronic version, and you can get that document, download it. We, um, at our various websites where you can get the free download of the entire book, um, there are um, additional documents uh, some of them are really extraordinary about uh, the history of some of these weapons and uh, the history of, of uh, Pentagon behaviors and so on. Um, we had, uh, the internet is a real opportunity and his staff, Rumsfeld staff and we came up with the same idea of making these available. We're going it one step further. The book is free. Um, anybody who writes to us can get a free copy of the book. Um, we have a nominal price of $10 for it at Amazon. Uh, it'll be up there quite soon. Um, and so it's not just the subsidiary materials that are free, but the entire text of our book is for free. Now, the Center for Defense Information right. um, is paid for by what group? Uh, foundations and board members. Uh, we don't take a single penny from defense manufacturers. Uh, we don't take any money from the United States government or any other government. Um, I started working for the Center for Defense Information in 2002 when I left Capitol Hill. And um, it's a remarkable place to work. Uh, I've never had the kinds of phone calls I used to get when I worked on Capitol Hill where somebody I worked for says, you know, what did you say? Um, um, the, you know, intellectual freedom to permit me to go where I think the facts take me um, is an extraordinary privilege uh, at CDI. There's a cover group called the World Security Institute. Mm -hmm. Who Who is that? Um, it's the same organization. It's the umbrella under which CDI exists. Uh, I actually direct the, so the Strauss Military Reform Project, which is part of the Center for Defense Information, and the CDI is part of WSI, the World Security Institute. It's an umbrella uh, of organizations. Um, um, basically, I'm pretty much the last person standing at CDI. The times are tough right now, but but um, it's been a pleasure working at this place. What do you mean times are tough? Uh, the foundations are drying up. Um, um, so I, I know I, I've got a list here, 2009, that foundation grants for 3.3 million to uh, the World right. Security mm -hmm. Institute, uh, and then 660,000 came from individual giving. So you're saying that that foundation part is drying up mm -hmm. uh, because of the tough economic times, um, and you know WSI has several parts to its operation. Um, and uh, the Center for Defense Information is, is one part of those. You think it'll survive? Uh, I hope so. Uh, I think it's very much needed. It was founded in the 1970s. It's been part of the Washington landscape. And interestingly, it was founded by retired military officers uh, who are not trying to pimp for the Pentagon budget, but um, were distressed that information avail available about, about defense issues was too one-sided, and they were trying to, to balance it out. Is, uh, do you, can you give us any indication of who some of the foundations are that have contributed? Uh, uh, Ford Foundation, uh, Education Foundation of America, um, those are two that come right to mind. Are they bigger, the biggest ones? 
I, I can't tell you. Uh, the finances, the, the less I know about the finances, the better. I don't want to have the back, in the back of my head, um, you know, if I write this, will somebody say X? Uh, and the people who run the Center for Defense Information, the people on the board I work with, are happy about that. Uh, and they've allowed me the freedom to write and, and say what I think the facts are. The Pentagon Labyrinth, the book, has 10 short essays to help you through it, as it says. Mm -hmm. uh, you write to them? Yep. Who, give us some of the idea of who the others are. Uh, sure. Um, altogether, by my calculation, we have over 400 years of experience uh, in defense issues. Um, um, there's some extraordinary authors here. One is Tom Christie, who spent more than 50 years uh, in the civilian bureaucracy in the Pentagon, finishing out as the uh, man overseeing uh, weapons testing, operational weapons testing, uh, the, the field tests of weapons. Uh, um, Pierre Spray, uh, who uh, as much as anybody else is responsible for systems like the A-10 and F-16 aircraft along with Colonel John Boyd and Colonel uh, Everest Riccioni. Um, people like uh, Chet Richards, a retired Air Force colonel involved in intelligence issues, uh, worked at Lockheed, uh, wrote a f fascinating chapter about how to understand a strategy and how to assess a strategy. Uh, Chuck Spinney, who uh, spent more than 30 years um, in the Pentagon, uh, wrote some really historic materials about how the Pentagon spends money, uh, complexity in systems, and the political methodology we use in this country to, to start, promote, and make endless uh, you know, buying a certain weapon. You write in one of your chapters about how to watch a hearing. Now, people mm -hmm. that watch this network have a chance to watch about 2,000 hours of hearings a year, <clears throat> and they can watch the Senate Armed Services Committee and the same committee on the House side a lot. But I want to go to one hearing that you wrote about mm -hmm. and show you some video here from the June 15th and 16th, 2010 hearing, the Senate Armed Services Committee. And what we see here on the screen is General Petraeus at the beginning mm -hmm. talking to people. What do you see as you watch this? I see a mass of staffers in the background. Don't think for a minute that the senators that you're about to hear are under-resourced. Um, you see right now the schmoozing between you know, uh, the chairman, ranking member, and the, and the witness. Uh, not exactly an adversarial relationship we're seeing here. Now you know, Joe Lieberman is coming up to sh give a short schmooze, and they, now they're going to set up the hearing. But couldn't that be just uh, politeness? It's part of the ritual. Um, uh, witnesses are uh, happy to be able to do that so they can get on the, you know, the right side and not have an adversarial hearing. And the committee leadership is indicating to the witness, this is going to be an easy hearing for you. We're not going to have a standoff attitude towards you. You're our buddy and uh, let's, let's schmooze and uh, then we'll all have a nice ch little chat here. Now, I'm, I'm going to ask you the question before each one of these clips, what's okay. wrong with this? Okay. We can watch them and then you can come back and explain it and I ask our, our viewers to do the same thing. Let's, let's, this first one is Carl Levin, who's the chairman of the, mm -hmm. at the time, chairman, it still is, chairman of the Armed Services Committee mm -hmm. in the Senate. Let's watch this and I ask you what's wrong with okay. it. How many Afghan troops are there currently in Kandahar and Helmand and about how many Afghan troops do we expect will be there in September? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd be happy to get that for you for, you, for the record. Uh, if I could rather just provide the, the overview of what it is that we're trying to accomplish uh, in that area. And you certainly touched on the importance of obviously getting the Afghans in the lead. We had a video teleconference with General McChrystal this morning, in fact, the normal weekly one that the Secretary does. The Chairman, Under Secretary <coughs> Flournoy, and I participate in that. And in that, he described, for example, how he will use some of the elements of the additional brigade going into the Kandahar belts, the districts around Kandahar City, uh, indeed to work with their Afghan partners uh, 
so that they can do what President Karzai also wants them to do, as he announced in the Shura Council on Sunday, uh, to the four or 500 or so uh, local leaders there in discussing what is coming uh, to Kandahar province, and that is that uh, Afghan forces lead wherever that is possible. Now, I guess, again, what's wrong with that? It's so nothing exchange. Uh, Levin um, has for a long time made a big deal about the Afghan security forces that he wants them carrying a bigger load. Um, he asked the question, how, much are gonna, how many of them are going to participate in this major operation in Kandahar that at the time of that hearing was, was coming up? Uh, incredibly, uh, Petraeus said, well, I don't know. I'll get that to you. Um, um, it demonstrates all kinds of incompetence to me. Uh, first of all, um, if this is a big deal in Levin's head, for, Petraeus should know it uh, if he's being properly prepared. Uh, he didn't prepare for it. He didn't uh, tell his staff to figure out uh, what Levin is going to be asking and what, what I need to know. Levin didn't uh, say to Petraeus' staff, I need to know this, you need to have this data. Um, thirdly, um, when uh, 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 after Petraeus said, I don't know, um, Levin never again in that hearing that I recall followed up and said, you better find out right now. Tell, send your, one of your 10 staffers that are sitting behind you out get that data to me. This hearing isn't going to end until you get it to me. The point is that Levin wasn't running that hearing in, uh, as far as information is concerned. Petraeus was. And he was making sure that no real information was getting to that committee. Here is, we're, we're going to run a clip, uh, but keep the volume down on it so you can see, but it was Senator Joe Lieberman who gave something like a four and a half minute uh, basic, I don't know if you call it a speech or not, but his, his opening statement, I think senators get at least five minutes, maybe sometimes ten minutes. But you made a point about this, and right. what, what is it? It's not a question, it's a speech. Well, and what's wrong with that? Uh, it's an oversight hearing. He's wasting his time and he's wasting my time. Uh, I want to find out about what's going on in Afghanistan. I don't care what's going on in, in Joe Lieberman's mind. Um, I want a hearing like J. William Fulbright ran with uh, William Rogers in the 1970s about Vietnam, where he was picking out information and in some cases knew more than the witness about what he was asking. Um, I want to find out about this war and what's going on. I don't want to know Joe Lieberman's political position on it. I'll, I'll send him a letter if I want to get a speech from him. All right. I'm going to ask you about somebody else in the committee, Mark Udall, Senator Mark Udall. Um, and let's watch what he does here, and again, what's wrong with this? Uh, General, um, uh, we all on the committee understand this is an important time in, in Afghanistan, and I think it would be useful uh, to be able to consider President Karzai a, a reliable partner. Uh, it's sometimes hard to understand uh, what he says versus what he does, uh, and vice versa. So I had a couple of questions in that regard. H how do you best explain uh, what seemingly is his mercurial personality. One day he talks about uh, making common cause with the Taliban, and then another day he goes down to Kandahar and gives an impassioned plea to the residents there to uh, cooperate in the upcoming fight. And then uh, secondly, uh, I'd had a chance to get to know uh, Minister Atmar and had great respect for his talent and his vision. Um, what do you think his departure might mean for the important, day, if you, maybe even crucial, um, police training effort. Thanks, Senator. Uh, for, on the first question. So, what's wrong? He's asking a question. He deserves points for that. He asked two questions. Uh, he's sort of like potting them up, you know, like, like callers into talk shows. I'll get my two questions out there, and, and uh, then I'll hang up and listen to the answer. Let me interrupt just a second to say, though, if he doesn't ask two questions like that, the witness can filibuster, and he'll never get that second question. Tell in. the witness to shut up. I've got another question. Who's in charge, the witness or the person asking the question? Secondly, um, um, you may not have time to run it, but the answer is sort of a vague answer, like, you know, Karzai has a tough job, and we're working on these problems. 
rather than um, what Jacob Javits told me when I worked for him in the 70s. Senator from New York. Right, a liberal Republican. Um, he said, don't you ever again ask, ask me to ask them a question that you don't know the answer to. In other words, he wanted me to be able to talk to him as that witness was answering him, saying, that's not entirely correct, that's not entirely complete. Instead, you have there a passive guy asking a question. He, had, he It's almost a dinner talk kind of question. Um, and they sort of chew it over rather than develop information, use the information to ask a follow-up question. There was none. Um, and to use the opportunity for this of this having this witness giving you information that you need to be able to legislate and decide um, what that authorization bill should contain for Afghanistan. The next one is Senator Scott Brown and a Republican from Boston or from Massachusetts. This is only seven seconds long, so let's run this. Mr. Chairman, I have a couple other hearings, uh, but I'm going to just ask two more questions and then turn it back uh, to the remainder of any time I have. What's wrong with that? Not a whole, not a, not a very good chance for follow-up if you're not, if you're not going to be here to, there to hear the answer. Um, um, he's flinging something out there, expecting I don't know what, uh, but he's not going to know because he's not going to be there. Uh, but there's a record. He can read it in the record. Um, perhaps, but given that kind of performance, I bet you he never even looked at the record. Um, if I recall correctly, the question he asked about was about the warlords in Afghanistan. Um, and um, uh, that's a very important issue. Uh, I would expect, if you think you've got a question important enough for you to ask in a nationally televised hearing, I would expect you to sit down and listen to the answer. And then I would expect you to ask some follow-up questions well, you forgot to point out this, you know, uh, general, or having, you're having said that, I've got this response. Um, instead, um, uh, if, if, you, if, you, if you watch some of these hearings, you'll see senators actually read questions off from a list prepared by staff. The answer will be provided, and rather than ask a follow-up question to develop more information, they'll read the next question on an entirely different subject. Okay, well, let me run this last clip from Senator Kay Hagan, a Democrat. You've had, we had an independent, a Republican, and a Democrat. This is a woman from North Carolina who is a senator and a Democrat. What, again, what's wrong with this? Improved security conditions throughout Afghanistan coupled with financial incentives and job opportunities can lead to effective reconciliation. And I know that U.S. officials have expressed support for the inclusion of the Taliban in a future Afghan government so long as any former militants joining the government break with al-Qaeda, lay down their arms, and accept the Afghan constitution. Uh, my, my question is, outside of the jirga on June the 4th, has President Karzai begun translating his reconciliation and reintegration initiatives into program and policies? Well, first of all, Senator, if I could just say that's a very accurate and quite a nuanced description, frankly, of the situation and of the basic concepts behind all of this. Uh, it's exactly right. What's wrong with that? Well, you saw her um, not really asking the question in her own head, but, re but essentially reading it off. Uh, she was doing a skillful job of checking her staff memo in front of her and sounding like uh, it was her question, but it was... Uh, apparent to me that she was reading from her from her notes uh, uh, staff memo. Secondly, um, we're having one of these schmoozing operations again um, where she reads off this sort of high-minded kind of policy question and uh, Petraeus butters her up with, oh, that's a, such a nuanced question, Senator. Uh, when I heard that, I said to myself, oh, uh, this is a question planted by uh, Petraeus, in, possibly. Um, it's not uncommon for a staffer to call up 
the staff of a, of a witness before a, he a hearing and say, well, what do you want to be asked? And a smart um, staff or people like Petraeus will say, well, here's a high-minded policy question that you can ask us and we'll give you a serious answer and we'll all sound like we're you know, doing important things here. You know, people that are, have been listening to you for the last 45 minutes, some of them are going to say right about now, this man is cynical, he's negative, he has no respect whatsoever for the Congress or for the military or the Pentagon. Answer those. I have immense respect for the Congress and the military. I don't respect the people who are occupying Congress right now. Um, I have immense respect for the people in the military who are doing uh, what, what they have to do in Afghanistan and in the, for the past few years in Iraq. I have immense respect for some of the military officers I've been working with for a long time and the people from inside the Pentagon. My problem, my cynicism, is a result of observing the way the leadership of this country has been behaving for the last few decades. Uh, when I first came to Capitol Hill in the 70s, um, we had some national problems on our hands. Uh, we had Watergate, we had uh, Vietnam and Indochina. Back then, there were some people who seriously took on those issues and tried to grapple with them and deal with them seriously. We don't have that now. What about General Petraeus? I mean, he's spent an enormous amount of time, four stars on his shoulder. He's over there in Afghanistan. Uh, what kind of marks do you give him? I think he's an ambitious man. Um, I think he's pursuing a fool's errand in Afghanistan. I think the surge that he's being credited with in Iraq was not the reason why we had a less disastrous ending in Iraq than we could have had. Um, um, for example, um, you know, we, we're, we're now able to withdraw from Iraq uh, not being kicked out. Um, the Al-Qaeda uh, is not an operative entity in Iraq. Um, the Sunni revolt uh, that was a large part of the reaction to our occupation of, of Iraq was um, suppressed not because of the surge but because the Sunnis got sick of what, of what, what Al-Qaeda was doing and they realized they needed to effect a change. Their decision to uh, change their behavior in reaction to the occupation preceded the surge. Uh, it was not caused by the surge. Uh, General Petraeus has a lot of status in this country, um, but it's my view that um, he got lucky in Iraq, and we'll see how it turns out in Afghanistan. So far, it's not turning out too good. But you could also look at what's going on over in the Middle East right now and conclude that the United States' effort in Iraq and Afghanistan has spread as they saw Iraq get more democracy. Some of these other countries, people hit, hit the streets. You know, you, we've been watching that for the last couple of weeks. I don't see that cause and effect at all. Why not? Um, because these are indigenous situations that started in Tunisia. Uh, they weren't imitating what was going on in Iraq, and I'm not real clear just how you know, democratic the situation in Iraq is. It's certainly not democratic in Afghanistan. Um, something far more fundamental than a reaction to U.S. policy is occurring in the Middle East right now. Um, this is the result of decades of, of government by autocratic regimes um, and these reactions are entirely indigenous from the bottom up, uh, not because of American policy. In fact, in places like Egypt, we were buddy-buddy with the reviled regime in Iraq for a long time. Um, and to pretend that we somehow stimulated the insurrection in, a, in, a, in Egypt is, is sounds like you know, neocon 
you know, delusion to me. Back in 2001, the Pentagon started calling for the need to buy tankers to refuel airplanes. I think the original was 100 planes they wanted right. to. Yep. We have watched this. This is a year. Right. This is 10 years later. This thing has been up and down and up and down uh, over 10 years where we don't have new tankers today. And they still haven't made the, deci the final decision on who will get the, as I understand it, who will get the tankers. Mm -hmm. And we, people have gone to jail. Uh, it's been awarded to one company and taken away from them and all put out for bids again. What in the world has this been about from your perspective? It's been about the, the acquisition system we have in the Pentagon and the way Congress interacts with it and the way uh, industry interacts with it. Um, this started, like you said, 10 years ago when Senator Ted Stevens floated a perfectly abysmal idea of lease purchasing Boeing 767 aircraft as tankers. A lease purchase is the world's most expensive way to acquire something. Um, Why do you want to do that? Uh, because it wasn't paid for in the procurement budget. Leasing is paid for in the operations and maintenance budget. And that means you've got more money to play with in the procurement budget. Uh, it also means that the O&M money you're spending on this acquisition is going to eat into things like training and spare parts in the O&M budget. But those aren't things that Senator Stevens was particularly concerned about. What was he concerned about then? I mean, why did he go this route? What benefit would it have been to him? He was convinced it was a good idea that do it behaving that way in the in the defense budget is is is, is a good idea. Um, I in his case, I don't suspect it was the primary motivation, but a couple months after that, he was handed some fat cam campaign contributions checks by Boeing executives. Um, um, but that, but that was, I don't think that was his primary motivation. I think his primary motivation was he thinks he thought that was good government. So what happened to this oh, What up and down over the years and who got into it and are we ever going to get these, uh, we meaning the Pentagon, ever going to get these new tankers? We'll get them eventually. Um, uh, yeah, it's been incredible ups and downs, but like you said, uh, we, uh, one official, Darlene Droyan, went to jail for her behavior. Boeing employee? Uh, well, she, oh. was, she, she was immediately after she, she left the Pentagon. She had been in the Air Force in the Pentagon? Right, she was a senior acquisition official in the, in the Air Force and was uh, um, dealing with Boeing um, as she was representing the Air Force uh, and um, took, her, took her job and ended up in jail, thank God. You know, we haven't got much time, but you also write in your, one of your chapters about this business of staffers looking over their shoulder at their next job. And, mm -hmm. and um, you were there as a staffer. Right. And is this something that has always been there? Were they looking, I mean, if you're working on the Senate Armed Services Committee staff or the House Armed Services, you are thinking about going to work for a, either the Pentagon or going to work for one of the uh, uh, defense companies? Yes, yeah, Legion and the Armed Services Committee and the Appropriations Defense Subcommittee. Um, they think the sign of a good staffer is somebody who goes to work for the Pentagon. That means you are really a quality guy or woman. Um, imagine this. Uh, you're tasked to oversee purchases of the F-35 you know, fighter for the Air Force, and your job in, on the Armed Services Committee is to make sure that the aircraft is effective and affordable and all these things. Um, meanwhile, your ambition is to go work for the Air Force as their senior acquisition executive. Um, so you're going to ask all these really aggravating, tough questions getting to the bottom of the F-35, and you're going to aggravate those officials who are in a position to offer you a job or not? Um, that's not the way it works. Um, you're going to cozy up to the Air Force. Um, they'll give you some information, you know, as much as they think, um, you know, they want you to have. And you'll be skillful in how you handle that information and you'll be convincing with your boss and everybody else around you, and you'll land the job in the Pentagon. Um, that's how our system of checks and balances breaks down. That staffer for the Armed Services Committee should be an, an aggressive son of a gun uh, with that program, and he should not care in the slightest how many people 
he gets angry at him because he's asking uncomfortable questions and exposing uh, um, mistesting or worse. Can you walk, I, I know you can't walk out of the Congress and go to downtown to lobby for a year or two, depending on which side you're on. Can you walk out of a job and, and the staff on either side into a defense contractor right away? Uh, there's a period of about a year where you can't deal with the people that you worked with on the Hill on the subjects you dealt with on the Hill. But you could go to work for the defense contractor. Oh, absolutely. Uh, you can go work for their international operations on X, Y, or Z, give them advice on how to deal with Capitol Hill, but you can't call your, your former boss or, um, or you can't lobby on uh, specific issues. Um, but sometimes the definition of the term lobby gets a little tricky and you can get around even that sometimes. How long have you been at the Center for Defense Information? Since 2002. So we're talking almost 10 years, yep. nine years. Have you seen, from your perspective, any accomplishments that we've been trying to bring about over the last nine years? I think so. Um, we um, focused on, one of the things we focused on was the F-22. I think we helped to educate the system about what that airplane is not. Um, it's too expensive and it's a huge disappointment in terms of performance. Same thing on the F-35. Did they stop, are they going to stop production of the F-22? They, uh, well, that's a good question. Uh, it's been stopped at 189 airplanes for $67 billion. Do the math on the unit price there. What is the unit price? $355 million per, per airplane plus. It's actually going up now because there's some follow-up work. Uh, we've done a lot of work in the F-35. We've done a lot of work in the defense budget. We've done a lot of work in pork. I think we've affected the system, and I think we've been a small part of the change that I think we're in the midst of right now, uh, the national attitude towards the defense budget where it needs to be controlled. We're out of time. Winslow Wheeler, the book is called The Pentagon Labyrinth, 10 Short Essays to Help You Through It. You can get it by going to what website? Uh, the CDI.org website, the Pogo.org website, or simplest best, the simplest yet is to simply Google the term the Pentagon Labyrinth and you'll get all kinds of opportunities to download it. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. For a DVD copy of this program, call 1-877-662-7726. For free transcripts, or to give us your comments about this program, visit us at qna.org. Q&A programs are also available as C-SPAN podcasts. Next, 